Uh, and telecommunication fraud continues to plague the industry with ever increasing sophisticated methods and tools from simple theft of services to international premium toll rate calling scams. Stories of service providers and enterprises being struck with thousands of dollars of fraudulent calls is a common occurrence that can be financially devastating. The Communications Fraud Control Association reports that in a 2015 service provider uh, suffered for over $22 billion in fraud. And during today's how-to session, uh, we'll be joined by the experts from Gerasoft, showing various methods that utilize real-time billing systems and session border controller software to stop fraud in its tracks. So let's get started. All right, so, so quick introductions. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Alan Percy. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Telco Bridges uh, and uh, today's event moderator, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, joining us today also is Mike uh, Stukalin. He's our Vice President of Sales for Gerasoft. Mike brings 12 plus years of engineering expertise, followed by 15 years of telecom business, and is joining us today from Gerasoft's development office. And Mike, thanks for sharing your expertise with us today. Uh, thank you very much, Ellen, and uh, hello, everybody. Yep, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So we covered today's introductions. Uh, we are, we're going to spend a few minutes and talk about the impact of telecom fraud. Uh, and Mike and Andre are going to cover some of the fraud methods and attack profiles, discuss what the concept of real-time fraud protection is and how it works, and then... Uh, how to implement fraud detection and prevention. Uh, I'll tackle that portion of the presentation. And then we'll wrap up with where you can learn more. And finally, uh, we'll handle some of your questions uh, and some questions that we got via email ahead of the session. All right, so Mike, I'm gonna turn uh, the session over to you to get started um, with your presentation. So um, when you're ready to go, just uh, let me, just give me a next and I'll advance the slide for you. Thank you very much, Alan. And uh, hello, everybody again. Um, this is an engineering company in the telecom business. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, an engineering team, uh, approximately 25 people right now. Uh, we have started in 2005 as a large scalable solution for, uh, at the time, wholesale telecommunications. Uh, today, we have customers in about 250 customers in about 40 plus different countries and all continents. Uh, we provide the billing solutions for telecom, for IoT, for OTT, MVNO, and so forth, so on and so forth. And just to give a little bit of an idea, all of us being engineers, the most important thing to us is understand the trend, help our customers, and support our customers as much as we can. Uh, next slide, please. Ellen. Um, you can um, see from this slide very quickly that uh, our expertise is in different fields, not just uh, telecom, but retail and wholesale sale VoIP are the main ones. Mobile VoIP has come in and MVNOs have come in lately. Business telephony is always popular. Um, IoT and uh, OTT is more newer uh, parts of what we do on a billing side. Um, SMS, wholesale SMS is also a newer addition to what, what we do as a company. Next slide, please. Alan. So the main components of our system, uh, besides the regular billing, invoicing, uh, generating invoices for prepaid and postpaid, uh, the four additional main components are retail services that can be used for uh, B2B telephony, OTT, and VNO, any type of end user telephony. A very, very robust and uh, flexible dynamic routing based not just on price, but based on quality and the latest additions. It's also based on swap deals that is coming down the pike in about a couple of months, uh, based on value of money, so to speak. Um, rates management where you can automatically download customer rates, uh, get your tariffs created automatically, simulate calls, see what you know, where the call is routed, how the call is rated, and so on. And jurisdictional billing, this would include in USA, interlata, intralata, interstate, intrastate, dipping into databases, 
uh, we do a number billing in Europe, which is important in Europe and in Asia. So all of these are our components. Uh, next slide, please. So more specifically to what we're going to discuss today and what this webinar is about is the cost and prevention of fraud in the uh, telecom industry. So we did a little bit of research um, and uh, what we found is according to CFCA, uh, the latest numbers available essentially are 2017, but it, it, it just keeps growing, we see the trend. And so the total losses by carriers are close to $30 billion in 2017. That's a staggering number and that's a number that certainly needs to be addressed. Um, next one, please. Uh, there is a little bit of a breakout of where those losses are. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but um, you'll have the slide. You can always contact us uh, if you want to discuss this, but you can see that about a third of it is actually attributable to uh, PBX hacking, and that means both the PSTN stuff, you know, the legacy stuff and the newer voice over IP stuff. Uh, the reason we did this breakout is just show you a little bit that there's some things that we can protect you from. There's some things that we can't, but we try. So next slide, please. So we try to, uh, for our own sanity and our customer's sanity, we try to break down the type of fraud and the victims of the fraud by categories. And so what we kind of settled on and so the telco bridges and we see eye to eye very much on this, as we do on many things, uh, is that there is fraud against the service providers and there is a fraud against the end users. So in general, our customers would be service providers. Our customers' customers would be end users. Both of them would have to be protected. And we'll talk a little bit about what differentiates the two, what specifics are uh, related to either one of them. So the way we see in broad strokes, the way we see the fraud against service providers, usually a fairly complicated and robust things. Um, it can be possession of SIP trunking, uh, simulated traffic, regulatory loopholes, you know, standard example of regulatory loopholes, which was pretty prevalent in Europe uh, two years ago. So uh, when European Union uh, essentially passed laws where calls within Europe should be less expensive than calls from outside of Europe, um, when a number billing wasn't available from majority of uh, our competitors, for example, people were fairly freely just spoofing the a number um, and calls from Africa, calls from Asia, calls from US uh, were shown as calls from within Europe. So Orange, for example, at that point, have stopped carrying wholesale calls into countries like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, uh, Romania, if I'm not mistaken. So there was there was quite a rush to get a number of billings billing done because of those regulatory loopholes, and it either cost some providers thousands and thousands of dollars, or the calls just couldn't go through. So the other type of fraud is fraud against the customers. So we're talking about the end users, be it um, B two B enterprise customers or OTT users or MVNO users and so on. What we see in there is generally, it boils down to taking over a customer's account to make free calls. I mean, it can be things that again, we can protect from, and I'll talk about it a little later on. It can be things like uh, stealing and cloning SIM cards and so on and so forth, but it's essentially what it boils down to is takeover of an account. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about the target service providers. So this is fraud. This is the types of fraud we, we see against service providers specifically. This is fraud against our customers and against Telco Bridges customers. So it can be transfer fraud, uh, as you can see, wholesale SIP trunking uh, stuff, FAS, uh, many of you are familiar with FAS, where suddenly you see a large increase in ASR uh, and uh, 
a very large decrease in A log or ACD. So in other words, the coals are connected to nothing. And so the coal is showing is connected, so it increases the percentage of ASR. So you think it's a good drought and a good connection. But since there is no here on the other end, the average length of coal is pretty much close to zero. Um, location routing and um, number fraud, uh, again, things of the nature of uh, A number spoofing and so on. Multiple transfer fraud and call forwarding fraud, which are similar things where calls are transferred and multiply transferred and forwarded to high cost destinations, be it Africa or Cuba or certain countries in Africa, Cuba, there's a number of places like this. Um, traffic pumping and related things uh, are very common. Uh, revenue sharing, um, IRSF, uh, where uh, a destination is taken over essentially and the fraudulent party shares the revenue with the somebody who took over the destination. They can charge whatever they feel like charging. So all of these are the service provider targets. Um, and we'll talk about how we try to prevent it and how we try to control it and how we try to alert our customers by analyzing larger chunks of data by doing statistical analysis. Next one, Alan, please. On the customer side, again, we see mostly um, takeover of the accounts. Uh, besides that, you can see the account takeover there is one of the uh, points. But besides that, we see in uh, denial of service attacks, uh, that's usually against a single customer or a single customer of a customer, where somebody would just make multiple calls and lay out their PBS, PBX uh, for whatever business reasons. I'm sure everybody has their reasons. Um, voice phishing is pretty common um, in US. On any given day, somebody calls me and asks me questions, trying to get my passwords or something like this. And you know, I'm still capable of defending myself, but my sainted 82-year-old mother, not so much. So this is becoming increasingly common and increasingly more and more complicated and increasingly more interesting. Uh, Van Geary is a very common scheme uh, where a call is made and hung up after a single ring. So customer sees on their mobile phone, the customer sees, oh, I miss a call. And I miss a call often from a spoofed number within his own area code. At least in US, this is what I'm seeing again on daily basis as a client, as a customer. The moment the customer calls back, he gets into either voice phishing or some pretty expensive uh, premium number type of scheme where his uh, service provider then charges him money. Um, next slide, please, Alan. Um, the important thing to notice here, and we've seen the theme, and the theme is this, who pays for all this wonderful stuff? So once the fraud is perpetuated, there is a very obvious blame ping pong game. The service provider blames the customer and says, pay me, these are your calls. The customer says to the service provider, you had to protect me from this fraud. So we're trying to, just like Telco Bridges, and we talk about it fairly constantly, we're trying to protect both, uh, both sides. It's not, not just protection for our customers who are service providers, it's protection for their end users. So going to, um, this particular um, slide, what I talked about is what is the difference in prevention techniques for the two types of fraud against the service providers and against the customers. Um, the way we see it, we can prevent fraud, try to prevent real time fraud and try to prevent non real time fraud. Real time fraud is mostly associated with the customers, with the end users. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to look at each call and we're trying to block a call before it goes through. Uh, we don't connect the call, we look at real-time patterns, we look on per-call basis and then we send an alert or we block a call or we do both. 
On the non-real time, when we work with service providers, we look at, after the call is connected, after the call is done, we analyze large chunks of data. We analyze array of calls, maybe for the last hour, the last two hours. And we'll look for unusual behavior, uh, both financially and geographically. And then we alert the customer and we can block a client or a destination. If the calls are suddenly, the client never had calls to Haiti, and suddenly he does and in large numbers. We can automatically block the destination, we can notify the customer. Uh, next slide, please. So as we talked about here, it's just more of a uh, refreshing of an idea. We try to protect both the service providers and the end users. And oftentimes we've seen end users demand that protection from the service providers. This is very important. Uh, and this is both on the billing side and the CV, uh, on the SVC side, we've seen the same kind of demands from both the service providers and end users. Try to protect us from fraud. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have a nice marketing person in house who found a very nice picture that you can all see and that's the visual implementation of the same idea. We're there to protect you. We're not just there to give you the functionality to do billing, to do switching, to do SB, SBC functionality. We're there to protect you as well. Next slide, please. Um, so our fraud protection scenarios in general break out into several different categories. Uh, so we'll look at abnormal expenses, abnormal expense patterns. If the customer, if the customer was paying their vendors ten thousand dollars a month for the last seven months, and now suddenly it's the middle of the month and he's at seventy thousand dollars to a given vendor, most likely something is not right. So we'll send a notification. Uh, letting them know that. Uh, quality statistics control is a huge importance. And when we talk, talked about FAST, for example, we looked at the quality of the calls. We look at the ACD, we look at ASR, we look at different quality markers and try to see if quality suddenly changed. And if it did and did abnormally, we monitor it and notify. Uh, abnormal usage behavior usually is geographic related. Again, if there were no calls to some destination, suddenly there is a lot of calls to the destination from a given customer, something is probably not right. Maybe the customer just signed somebody and suddenly opened that route, maybe. But again, the service provider needs to know that and needs to be notified. Uh, and lastly, there's balance and capacity controls. Um, you can set the limits to how much money your end customer can, can uh, spend. It could be per destination, it could be total on the account, and so on. Um, you can also limit the number of calls per account. Uh, we often see unusual behavior. This is going back to calling card times. You see the unusual behavior pattern where um, suddenly there are multiple calls from a single account. Now, for PBX, this would be normal behavior for a single customer with OTT that wouldn't be. So again, we monitor it and we ask uh, soft switch or we ask SBC to monitor it as well. Next slide, please. So benefits and needs for the fraud protection. We all know we need fraud protection, but as main benefits, um, your end customers are protected against financial losses. And the service providers, as they deal with their customers can improve the relationship because as I mentioned, there is always blame ping pong. Who is responsible for financial losses in situations like this, financial damages. And it often causes either a legal battle or the service provider writes it off understanding that he's not gonna chase a customer who owes him $10,000, just not worth it. So we try to prevent the situations, we try to improve the relationships between the service providers and their customers on both ends. And the way we feel is in today's communication business, just you can't afford the, you can't afford to be without fraud prevention, fraud protection. Our next slide is on. And finally, uh, just you can see uh, a way to contact us and uh, what I wanted to mention again, what I wanted to 
leave you gentlemen and ladies with is that we have worked with um, Telco Bridges for a number of years. We've done a number of interrupts, both in real time and uh, in non-real time communication. We have a number of customers together. So it is important that our technical teams and our support teams are very capable of working together to resolve any of the problems. Uh, we communicate, as you see here, we communicate not just on fraud prevention stuff, but we communicate well with each other, we work well with each other. So it's a good combination for a service provider to have, as an example, to have Telco Bridges, SBC, and Gerasol billing solution. So at that, I will uh, throw it back to Ellen, and uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'll be here for questions and answers session. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for the uh, content. And I just want to add, too, that Gerasoft, when uh, we uh, launched our uh, free and pro SBC initiative, is one of the first to step forward to join our alliance partnership program. And uh, that's sort of the root of much of this development that we've put together. Okay. So let's take a closer look at uh, the role of SBCs in real-time billing. And I'll get a little bit deeper and talk how much of this is implemented uh, and how you can implement it in your network. So now you, you've learned a little bit about it. Uh, but we did see there were a few people on the call that um, are new to Telco Bridges. Um, and I just wanted to quick introduce the company uh, to those uh, individuals. Um, as you probably know, we're a, a, a smaller VoIP gateway and, and session border controller vendor, uh, privately held um, and um, been in the business since 2002. We're roughly 35 employees. Uh, we're headquartered just outside of Montreal, which is where I am today, uh, in the offices for the company, and which is where most of the software development, the administration, uh, the, the uh, research and development is done, uh, where we have sales and support offices now in Poland, Turkey, and Hong Kong, providing uh, um, around the globe uh, technical support for our, for our customers, for our media gateway and session border controller customers. So. Uh, a very focused organization on delivering high scale, high quality media gateways and session border controller software. And I uh, appreciate you joining us today. Found this, um, in our doing our research, found this really interesting uh, infographic uh, about the uh, international premium rate number problem. Uh, and it, it walks really through exactly what's happening in the marketplace. And this is where a lot of the really outrageous loss is, is, seems to be happening uh, to consumers, and as a service provider, uh, you can you know you can easily help your customers prevent this. Uh, or enterprises seem to have this problem too, which is, you know, the criminals acquire a set of numbers um, for an international premium rate number, right? And this is where you in the states we would call it you call a 900 number, and you know you're going to be charged so many cents per minute extra on top of the cost of the call. Uh, for some service, so it could be a date line, or it could be a you know a, a football score line, or something like that. Uh, anyway, the criminals get a hold of one of these numbers, and they set it up um, as a high rate charge, uh, and then they what they do is they generate a very large volume of international calls using spoofing uh, and botnets to uh, end users. They could be on a PBX, they could be on their cell phone, they could be on their home phone, and typically when people get a call. With a phone number that looks similar, or somehow um, you know maybe is a, a regional telephone number, um, they might call that number back. And when that callback happens, of course it routes through all the wholesale providers, et cetera, et cetera. But it, eventually it lands on the final operator um, who charges that international premium rate to that call, all the way back to the original uh, uh, initiator, you know, the callback. Uh, victim and of course this ends up on their telephone bill and for one or two instances you might say well it's only a few bucks but what the problem is is these bad guys are accumulating all this money and they're often using it for nefarious purposes it's terrorism it's international bank fraud I mean there's all kinds of things that are happening um, and there's a great article I got the link here at, at the very bottom of the slide that explains this in much more detail you know, I highly recommend it. And this is one of the many areas that, you know, we recognize, you know, Gerasoft and Telco Bridges and many of our other partners um, is an important area that we need to protect against. <clears throat> okay, so um, you learned a little bit about um, so, some of the mechanisms. Let's talk about how uh, it's actually implemented. And there's a couple of key pieces of technology that uh, make this all happen. One of them is 
uh, is a protocol called RADIUS, and that's actually an acronym. Uh, and what this is, is it's, it's defined by a couple of uh, RFCs, uh, IP-based protocols that allow the, the call processing information to go between um, two different endpoints within the network. And I'll show you in a couple of slides how this all works in, in quite, quite a bit of detail. Uh, one of the benefits of RADIUS is that it, um, it, it not only is IP-based, but it also has the ability of um, doing many transactions per call. So calls often, you know, they're not just you set up a call and at the end of the call you hang up. There's call transfers, there's call holds, there's call recalls, there's all kinds of things that can happen on the call and RADIUS can handle all those things. Um, and then one of the other big benefits is that it's done in real time, you know, as the call progresses. Uh, this information is transferred to a billing system along with authentication uh, and one of the more powerful tools is also this uh, support for forwarding and routing and again i'll show you how this works in a, in a little diagram in a moment here along with a session duration timeout so a, a billing system for example can say um, you can call this number but you only have so many minutes uh, and then a lot of prepay applications that comes in very handy Call detail records, which is an alternative mechanism, is a little bit older, a little bit simpler. It's just basically text files. It's done usually batch. It's not real time. It's usually collected for some period of time. It might be as short as five to 10 minutes, or it might be an entire day's worth of calls in a text file. Um, it doesn't have authentication. It has no ability to route calls. So when you start to look at ways of integrating billing systems in, these are the kinds of things that you need to decide about. Do I want to use CDR or do I want to use RADIUS? And of course, what we're hopefully making clear to you is that RADIUS has a lot of powerful features that'll help in protecting fraud. Okay, a uh, quick peek at some, uh, some diagrams here. Uh, and this is um, kind of the prototypical service provider network. Uh, many of you probably recognize it if you operate a network. Um, you know, on your left, you've got some subscribers and maybe some trunking. Uh, and maybe your IPX connections or connections from the PSTN. There's generally an ingress SPC or gateways that bring traffic into your network. Uh, and then you've got some kind of soft switch or you know a, a class four switch maybe that does all your, your traffic management. And then there's usually an egress, either SPC or gateway that then passes calls on in, you know, further into the wholesale network or maybe on um, to um, delivery to um, actual consumers. Across the top, you see here, is where the billing system fits. And in general, um, our experience is, is that at the point of ingress, um, there would be a radius link to a billing system. And this is where much of that decision-making we talked about um, in, and we'll demonstrate here um, happens. There are other places it could be integrated with a soft switch or it could be integrated with the egress SPC or gateway. But the point is, is that the billing system uh, and these uh, SPCs or gateways play an important role in, you know, routing and managing the traffic and tracking, uh, the, you know, the customer spend. <clears throat> so how does this all work? And I'm going to give you a, um, a, a couple of block diagrams. Well, what I brought up here is a little bit more specific case, and this is a unified communications as a service network. So this might be hosted IP PVX, it might be uh, hosted um, complex platforms with voice and video conferencing. But, you know, there's a, a customer on the upper left here. It's an SMB or an enterprise. It might have IP phones on their desk or might be soft clients. Generally, are sitting behind some kind of a, a router or internet access device. Um, and the service provider on the right, generally in some kind of cloud infrastructure, is going to terminate that traffic onto a session border controller. Um, they're going to use whatever this UC... Um, platform software to manage and provide features and services, but they're gonna have two other critical elements. One of them is you're gonna have a billing platform that's gonna help them uh, keep track of what the customer's usage is, uh, and also you know, connectivity one way or another out to the public network, right? People, when they pick up the phone in an enterprise, they generally call people that are out in the public network. Uh, and this is where um, potentially where fraud might might happen. So what, what happens when these calls are made? So, you know, if someone picks up the phone in the, in the enterprise, dials a telephone number, basically saying, I'd like to make a call. It signals, of course, to the, to the CAS platform that, um, that wants to make the call. The UC uh, platform then says, okay, let's, let's route it out to the PSTN based on the number you called. So it sends that call off to the session border controller. The session border controller confers with a billing platform, 
uh, in this configuration and sort of says, okay, um, this call would like to be made to this number. What do you think? And if the billing system says, yeah, it looks good, everything's great, um, let's route it. I'll give you a route over the radius link and I'll give you a time limit um, for the call. Um, so we're gonna route it to the PS10 and there's no time limit, so all is good. Um, go ahead and forward the call off to the public network. So everything works. You know, the end user sees, picks up the phone, dials the number and off it goes. Uh, and <clears throat> in a nutshell, this, you know, the session border controller is providing the interface to the billing system, and the billing system is kind of managing and protecting against the fraudulent traffic. And I'll show you next what happens when uh, there's a fraudulent call. So again, uh, we talked about that uh, international uh, prime um, you know, rate, the premium rate uh, call, maybe um, someone picks up the phone and dials that number that's in the Dominican Republic or um, in Africa, that's um, a bad number that potentially could be um, a high charge value. Got to pick up the phone, dial that number. Uh, the CAS platform doesn't know anything about it, but it just sends it to the SBC like before. But now the billing system um, looks at the number and says, okay, something's wrong here. I don't like this. Um, it's a bad number, do not route it. And of course, at that point, the SBC is gonna drop the call because the radius command said this is a bad call, don't route, all right? And that prevents the call from, from going out to the public network and from the enterprise from being defrauded. And of course, everybody's happy because uh, a disaster was averted. All right, so let's take a little closer look and look at what happens on these radius links. Just to give you a peek at what happens in this transaction, on the left here, we've got either the SPC or one of our gateways that has a radius uh, link on it. On the right-hand side is a billing platform like Jerisoft's platform. Uh, and this is gonna be an accepted call. This is gonna be a call that is um, okay to route. So we're gonna see first is on the radius link, you're gonna see an access request. It's gonna include the called calling in session ID uh, of the uh, attempted call. The billing platform is going to respond back with, this is good, so an access accept. So I'm going to accept, uh, a, you know, I, a, I suggest you do process this call, and I'm going to give you a route uh, by name, and I'm going to give you a maximum duration for that call based on, on the number that you dialed. Uh, at that point, then, the SBC will uh, continue to initiate the call. It'll send some what are called accounting requests, including the start time, potentially the end time, what route was actually taken, uh, and the billing platform will acknowledge that. And these dialogues continue as calls or maybe transferred, uh, and you know other activities happen, including going to the end of the call. Um, so this is the transaction that happens between them for the accepted. In a rejected scenario, it's a little bit different. You know, again, the access request goes over to the billing platform, and then uh, the billing platform um, would respond with access reject. Uh, and then at that point, the SBC would send an accounting request saying, you know, the start time and the end time, which would be the same with a duration of zero, uh, which would then be logged. So this is a way for the billing platform to, you know, to kind of confirm that um, and record in its log files that a call request is made and rejected and um, should yield no cost to the customer. So at this point, hopefully now you understand enough about radius to be dangerous. <laughs> so let's move on. All right, um, so uh, in, in, in typically how this is deployed, um, especially in big global uh, service providers is, is through some kind of level of redundancy. There might be you know, SBCs or gateways in, in a, one country or another country uh, and using backup radius links um, to, uh, multi, you know, redundant billing systems. So a billing system in the upper left might be the primary for the gateways for the Americas. Uh, if that were particular one were to go out of service or the link were to be lost, then the SBC or gateway would go to a backup that might sit, for example, in Europe uh, and then that um, vice versa is, is covered for the European geography uh, and the billing systems do you know full redundancy back and forth and maintain shared databases uh, and the SBCs and gateways know how to use um, these alternate links to be able to get back and forth and this, this provides this geo redundancy. Well, I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about the uh, Togo Bridges portfolio. Um, of course, we've got a line of um, scalable um, 
um, media gateways and signaling gateways um, from our um, TMG 800 all the way up to our TMG 7800 for service providers and, and large enterprise. Uh, and also, as you know, in the last um, 18 months, we've added our virtualized session border controller software packages, free SBC and pro SBC, and uh, uh, support and professional services uh, offering from our service group in uh, pro services. So um, you know, a portfolio of not only gateways and SBCs that support radius. And um, a comment on our pro SBC platform, this, um, this is, you know, targeted towards service providers and enterprise, um, you know, many of the use cases access peering and, and software as a service. And it does support both CDR and radius um, for, you know, those commercial applications with encryption um, and includes live support with optional 24 seven support. Uh, and we sell this at a one a subscription price of a dollar per session per year. So, uh, you know, a thousand session SBC would be a thousand dollars a year subscription. And of course, professional services and 24 seven will be in addition to that. All right, so where can you learn more about um, these um, kinds of solutions? Um, we've got um, quite a bit of material uh, on our pro SBC and free SBC.com pages. Um, we've got lots of dialogue on this and many, many other questions in our you know, past sessions on our forums at forums.freesbc.com. Uh, and another resource I'm gonna point you to is, um, you know, this is our 19th monthly webinar. Uh, all 19 of them uh, are posted on the, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash telco bridges, uh, along with a lot of other content we've developed from various trade shows and events and guest interviews and our podcasts and others are on, on there. So I definitely recommend um, spending a couple of minutes there um, and definitely subscribe to that. Um, for additional information. And with that, we're gonna turn to our Q&A panel and see what we've got in a uh, set of questions. So Mike, you ready to handle a few questions? We'll let you get unmuted again here. <clears throat> All right, so um, we've got a handful of questions that came in. Yep, okay, a handful of questions that came in via email ahead of time. Uh, and one, one of the questions I, th I think is kind of a good one is, um, you know, are there really some known domestic fraud areas? And, uh, and I think we covered a couple of them, um, but Mike, maybe an Andre, maybe um, I'll just throw it out to you. Is, you know, is there maybe some specific other examples of, of, of areas of domestic fraud or, or fraud that might occur in, in the other regions of the world? Well, what we're seeing, um, Ellen, what we're seeing is, as I mentioned, in uh, Europe, it was quite common to have a number spoof, and it's extremely important there because the calls um, can have a factor of 10 difference in price based okay. on call and party on the A number. Um, in US, um, there are a few things we're seeing. One of them is revenue sharing, but Again, this is more of a legal issue rather than a technical issue where in US there's so-called underserved areas sure. where there's physically no copper in the ground from the 50s and 60s. And so a local CLEC can charge whatever they choose to charge for calls there. Uh, it's not a problem if the calls are going there legally and the likes of Verizon and AT&T so, uh, basically paying for it. Um, it is a problem if somebody takes over a SIP trunk uh, and sends the calls there and it's not like the rest of the US which is half a penny a minute or less. Mm -hmm. um, they can easily charge 40, 50 cents. So again, it's what we see on both sides of the Atlantic and uh, um, somewhat similar things in Asia and places, but what we see is um, you have to monitor your revenue or monitor your expenses, I should say, on a daily basis right. uh, due, to, uh, due to what the fraud is boiling down to is not a lot of calls to cheap destinations. It's mostly calls to a very expensive destination or from a very expensive destination in the case of A routing in your A, a number billing in Europe. Okay. So this is kind of the trend that we're seeing. Okay. Good. Uh, 
another good question here is um, maybe Mike, you could explain. You know, what, what's the deployment model um, for for Jerisoft? Is this a, is this a cloud platform or is this a is this a a software platform that a service provider would host in their own infrastructure? And then what's the business model? Is this a subscription or is it um, a purchase? Like well, as I mentioned, as I mentioned previously, myself and the great majority of the company is engineers. And being engineers, we just throw software over the fence and let the customers do whatever they want with it. Um, in reality, um, in reality, <laughs> not be fastidious. Um, there are um, two models of deployment. Actually, there are three models, but two of them can be combined. One is when the customer puts our software, our license. They're on their own server or on their choice of a call. Um, it can be one server or it can be redundant, um, redundant solution and uh, clustered solution. Just like um, Ellen mentioned uh, in his one of his slides, it could be geographically redundant. So it could be in different locations in different offices. The other option is, of course, to put it on a cloud. Uh, we've tested it with numerous clouds like uh, AWS. By Amazon, um, Profit Bricks, uh, there's quite a few around the world. Our <coughs> customers lately, the split seems to be about maybe 60% on the cloud, they would say, and 40% in Colos. But we give both options. As right. far as the license itself, um, traditionally, we have sold a perpetual license. So you purchase a license, it comes with six months of support. Uh, we do full training, we do full uh, integration help, and uh, specifically with Telco Bridges, it's pretty easy. We've done several integrations, so we just help each other and get the customer up and running as soon as possible. Uh, and we provide six months of 24-7 support. About half of our company is in support department, and we like to keep it this way. It's extremely important to us, again, as engineers. Right. Uh, the other option is, instead of buying and running a perpetual license, we have introduced about a year and a half ago, we introduced an OPEX model, which is basically a rental model. Uh, currently, there is no upfront cost. Currently, there is no long-term commitment. We understand clearly that those customers that like what they see and like what we provide will stay with us. We have customers staying with us for 10 plus years. Uh, and it's purely a monthly um, rental uh, which includes the 24-7 support, includes the same training and same integration help up front. So mm -hmm. those are the options I think we're pretty flexible, just like Elko Bridges is in okay. uh, what we offer our customers. And an area that's intriguing, I think for a lot of folks too, is the idea, um, uh, I think there's a, a desire to say, hey, um, if there's an, a blacklist or a way that you can pre-identify um, you know, fraudulent calls. Is that something that you, you maintain as part of the service? Um, you know, if, if, a, if a bad call number pops up on your radar that you share that them with all the subscribers or you know, how does that happen? Well, I, uh, as I mentioned, we have our CTO here, Andre, and uh, since he's infinitely more technically capable than I am, I'll let him answer this question. Uh, <laughs> okay. Better person. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Andre, and uh, I'm CTO of Gerson. So, uh, answering this question, I'd say that um, taking into account the uh, widespread of clouds nowadays and the, how easy it's uh, possible to change the IP address and uh, how easy it's to have multiple multiple uh, IP addresses for your fraudulent uh, tasks. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to maintain this kind of database uh, because it just so easily changed. Uh, what's uh, as opposite to this? Uh, as a, as a kind of solution, what we, what we do and what our what we see is that our customers do is we maintain not central but per customer a database of fraudulent numbers or fraudulent destinations, uh, which are typically used for traffic pumping and uh, for different uh, IRFS uh, schemas, and uh, the calls to these destinations are automatically blocked when they are placed on the mm -hmm. platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and that's shared then amongst the um, the subscribers. Is is that the idea? Um, say it again, please, Alan. I'm sorry. So so that uh, you maintain a database of fraudulent numbers, um, and then as a subscriber, then this would kind of be something that's included with my subscription. Is that um, I have access to this database of suspected fraudulent numbers. Uh, that's more typically maintained at per each deployment because okay. uh, depending on the region, uh, there might be a, a huge differences. So that's, that's typically kept at the customer's location. Uh, and uh, like it's, it, it's, it's, it's usually a result of uh, machine learning and uh, which we analyze the traffic points and uh, it results in the local database per, on, on per customer basis. Okay. To just uh, jump in a little bit here, Alan. So what um, what is important here uh, is we use this in our own internal algorithms. Mm -hmm. We use this for analyzing, like I mentioned, analyzing large chunks and large array of calls. And Andre gave a very good example. If you live in Liberia, the chances are that you call into Somaliland are pretty high. If you live in in I don't know, in Oklahoma, the chances are somewhat lower. And if you live in Kosovo, the chances are close to zero. So what I'm saying is we look at not as much as blocking specific IP addresses because it's not really conducive to today's way of deployments and doing business. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create an algorithm that is specific to a given customer of ours, just historically for his geographic location and for his specific call patterns for his end users. Okay. So we prefer to do it this way and then we feed it into our algorithm and we analyze uh, <coughs> traffic Good. going. Okay. All right, just a quick reminder, folks, um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can go uh, use the Q&A panel in the upper left-hand corner of your screen and uh, go ahead and submit your question. We got a couple more here, um, and we'll move on. So, uh, uh, one of the questions that came in uh, email ahead of time um, was uh, kind of asking about: Is there industry organizations or carrier groups, or um, you know, re maybe regional groups that that address these kinds of issues? And I know from my own personal experience. Um, I've gone to some of the Canadian teleco operator uh, sessions or conferences, and um, they definitely have working groups. There's definitely side discussions and working groups to talk about fraud, um, fraud protection, fraud avoidance, the customer fraud. Uh, it's um, it's a it's almost every one of the service provider conferences I've been to. There's some track about fraud because it's such a pervasive problem. So I don't know, Mike. W what's your experience, Ben? Uh, essentially, just like you said, Alan, what we try to do is we go to uh, probably eight to ten trade shows a year um, in U.S., in Europe, and uh, sometimes in Asia. We just came back from WWC in uh, Madrid, for example, uh, I believe about a week and a half ago. Uh, and what we get at those trade shows, first of all, there are enough people and everybody is talking and discussing fraud, but there are panels there. And so we sit on uh, the panels and we try to hear and understand as much as possible on the current trends, on the current things related to fraud and fraud prevention. Um, I don't know personally of any specific, um, specific organizations or specific central casting, so to speak, for fraud prevention. Um, basically part of the a big con, a big plus, of, a big pro, I should say, of having uh, numerous customers like we do in, as I mentioned, about 250 plus customers in both mm -hmm. four, two, I believe, different countries. You get this feedback more in the form of sharing information and often in the form of requests for features and requests for algorithms. Right. So we try to keep our own internal database. Uh, we share it with our partners, with switch providers, with SBC uh, providers. And uh, 
whilst there is no, as far as I know, there is no central place for this information, we uh, try to stay up to the trends and try to share it as much as we can. Okay. All right, maybe one more question here. Um, uh, it's about insurance. Uh, it, it, I, and I can definitely understand this. You know, if you're a moderate sized service provider or an enterprise, uh, and um, you either get one of these, these um, TDOS attacks that include some kind of uh, shakedown, right? And I mean, that's basically how those TDOS attacks occur is, you know, you get an email that says, hey, listen, if you don't transfer $10,000 in Bitcoin to this account number, um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to crush your inbound trunks. And they mean a lot to you because you're a call center or um, you do a lot of commerce over the telephone and you ignore that email and all of a sudden you find out that your, all your phone lines are tied up for an hour. And you get another email that says, see, I told you I could do it. Send the money or else. Um, and uh, a lot of businesses fold and they do. They pay the ransom. And um, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's a huge expense in some cases and they don't have the money to, um, or the cash flow to be able to handle that more than once. And you know the bad guys, if, um, if they know you're willing to pay ransom, they'll come right back at you again sometime later for more money. So what kind of insurance, um, have, you, um, have you considered exactly um, how, these can, how the organizations can protect themselves with insurance? You know, Ellen, it's, it's a bit scary because it sounds like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> but um, well, it's because I go to these conferences and I hear the stories and I go, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, we, all got, we all got war stories and scars in this yeah. for the last 15 years for me and I'm sure a lot for you. Yeah. So um, what we are seeing, it's actually, it's going back to the question of, um, you know, chicken and egg, you know, who's supposed to protect whom in this business. Uh, I am not aware per se of specific insurance related to fraudulent traffic. However, it is so geographically diverse. In US, there are general business insurance that could include liability, could include business losses and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can just buy business insurance, it's not that expensive and uh, to my knowledge, a great majority of people I know don't have any inkling to buy it. Um, what I am um, kind of, what my train of thought is, is this, that an end customer should and has every right to ask his service provider, if not for insurance, at least for assurance that the service provider is thinking about fraud scenarios, is aware about of fraud scenarios, and is trying to protect end customers as much as he can. By the same token, the service provider has every right to ask a company like Gerisoft and a company like Tel Telco Bridges or any provider at all, what is it that you guys are doing to protect us? Right. Now, everybody has an end user license agreement and contracts and every protection under the sun. And everybody says, if you lose $100,000, we're not responsible. But that's worse about the paper it's written on. And in my opinion, every service provider and down to their customers should ask a question, what is it that you actually do to protect us from fraud? And part of the reason we're involved in this particular webinar and part of the reason I'm sure that you did this webinar is because this question is asked constantly. And it's yeah. a very pertinent and very real question. And as you can see, both companies are trying to address it. And I think addressing it pretty uh, effectively, if I can blow my own horn. Yeah. So. Good. And, okay. So. Very good. Very good. Well, um, I think we're at the bottom of our uh, list of questions here. Um, so, um, for, uh, Mike, I want to thank you and Andre for sharing your expertise and, uh, and also thank our audience for spending some time with us today. And with that, I want to thank everyone one more time and thanks uh, guys for your help. And that's it from here. Wishing you all a great day. Thanks for listening. I hope you found this content useful. And don't forget to share this with any other coworkers or others who might be interested. Also, don't forget to click on subscribe and there's links below.